but I'm not going on an official hair strike until Hans de Fuco meets my very reasonable demands. I like to answer questions that I get on YouTube, so let's get to it. Learn guy songs like Irish droning songs, Dropkick Murphys, is a good one, along with Sandlot, Toss In, F You I'm Drunk, and Guitar Guy, Mojo Reverse. Now, this does not apply to all situations. There's a difference between being a guitar guy and a guitar douche. Note, bagpipes are always cool in any situation, fun at parties, or at least thin the crowd, LMAO. So this is in response to if you want to be the guitar guy at a party. And I really just wanted to bring this up because it mentions bagpipes. And I have a very interesting bagpipe story that happened to me semi-recently. And it just kind of goes to prove that I can't take anything seriously. So I was at a funeral for my late great uncle Bud, super cool dude, super old guy. When it's a situation like that where it's like a life well lived, I kind of see funerals as like a celebration of life more than anything. So I wasn't exactly mourning per se, but uh, <laughs> I'm at this funeral and I'm in like the second row, right? And there's an organ player and it was kind of like the beginning of the whole procession type thing. And uh, this organ player is just kind of like just going, just going ham. He's like really feeling like this Irish kind of kind of song that he was playing. So I was like, hey, this guy's, this guy's killing it. Good for him. You know, he was like really getting into it. And then all of a sudden, out of the corner of my ear, do I hear the faint screeching of a loud bagpipe set. And uh, this bagpipist starts coming in from outside and he's marching down the middle of the church. I had no idea there's going to be bagpipe. If you've never heard bagpipes live, they're the loudest things that you could ever, ever possibly hear. So uh, I'm a little taken by this bagpipe player as he's coming down the aisle, he passes me. And extremely, extremely heavy set guy in like the full Irish uh, garb kilt, except he kind of had like some, uh, some like 1992 Oakleys kind of like on his head, which kind of really, you know, broke down the fourth wall for that whole thing. Anyway, so he's like really going, going to town on these bagpipes. He gets to the front, uh, in front of the casket and he makes eye contact with the, the organ player and they just start jamming together and they're like really feeling it. And I'm just like, this is a little much. And, uh, as it went on longer and longer, seemingly for eternity, the bagpipe guy really started laboring because if you've ever seen those, it takes a lot of breath to like blow and like do, do a bagpipe set. And uh, his face became so red, it looked like he was going to pass out. Again, extremely heavy set guy, starts sweating profusely. And he's just like feeling every single note of this bagpipe solo. And uh, I totally lost it. I completely 100% lost my crap in the middle of this funeral where I just had to like bury my face in my hands. I was laughing so hard trying to do it silently, which I think was even bringing more attention to myself. And I was trying to play it off like I was emotionally crying. And uh, I was sitting next to my mom and she's like, what the hell is wrong with you? Get it together. And I just could not get it together. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation like that where you're laughing in an inappropriate spot. I have many, many times uh, if there is an opportunity for me to somehow ruin an inappropriate moment or make it awkward, I just have a tendency to take it. So I'm totally losing it for the duration of the bagpipe thing. And even afterwards, I still couldn't quite get it together. So that was kind of an embarrassing moment. Uh, if you want to look at it that way, I like to think that my Uncle Bud would have been proud of me. The only thing is, once I've passed the threshold of an immediately embarrassing moment, I kind of feel like I'm playing with house money and all bets are off. So after that, we went to this like super fancy, very ritzy club for, uh, I guess, the wake. And I was pretty stoked about getting some of this free food. And uh, I got there and the spread was very disappointing. It was like really kind of like that rich people food where it's just like little crackers with an unidentified fish on it and some kind of like cream sauce on top of that. So I was a little bit bummed, but then I saw this tray like with a spotlight on it. And I looked at it and angels just started calling my name. And there's a tray of these enormous freshly baked cookies, right? So I was all about that. So I kind of run up to this tray and I just like stack like a plate of cookies like this high. So we're at, we're at like the head table of this wake and people are coming up to my grandmother and kind of like saying, oh, I'm really, really sorry. Meanwhile, like here's this like 33 year old guy just like <laughs> chowing down on these enormous cookies. And uh, the staff was like decked out in like tuxedos. It was such a risky place. So they got, you know, they're serving drinks to everybody. You know, everybody's getting kind of trashed. 
And uh, if you've watched the channel, I don't drink. I've never even drank before. So the waiter comes up and he's like, can I get you something to drink, sir? And again, I was like mid like giant cookie. And I was like, uh, <laughs> I go, sir, could I trouble you for a glass of milk? Right? And he looked at me like, "Is are you serious, man? You're going to like <laughs> maybe go get you a glass of milk? And I'm like, yeah. So he le he's like, yes, sir, right away. Because I mean, that was the job. So he leaves. Again, my family's looking at me like, what the hell's wrong with you, dude? So he comes back with this like crystal carafe of like whole milk. <laughs> and he goes, your milk, sir, with like the napkin over his forearm and everything. And I was like, thank you very much. Before it even left his hand, I dunked an enormous cookie into this carafe of milk. So uh, I like to think that that bagpipe player just kind of set me off. Anyways, that's my most recent experience with bagpipes. But uh, hopefully maybe someday I'll have a bagpipist on this channel. Or maybe if we're lucky, I'll even try to pick up the craft myself. Because it seems like there are a lot of opportunities afforded for a fine bagpipe player with an Irish heritage such as yours truly. Does YouTube pay your rent? So it's coming up on two years I've been doing the YouTube thing and I kind of feel like I have enough experience to kind of see the dynamics of the trends and stuff and how you get paid. I always remember when I was first starting out, I was always so curious to find out how much YouTubers make. And again, you know, like in the grand scheme of things, I don't have like a huge channel. But uh, another thing that I was always curious about is like no one ever really tells you how much money they make. And I know some people might think it's like a little bit unbecoming to kind of like talk about numbers. But uh, honestly, I'm just, I was always so curious how other people make, uh, like to find out what it was and just kind of think if it's maybe I should be, if it's something that I should be putting more time into. So really you get paid by views, right? And generally a good rule of thumb is like, you make a dollar something per thousand views. So I think I make something like a dollar fifty per thousand views, which, which I've been told is a little more than average. Uh, it depends on a lot of different factors. As of right now, I'm making a little over $900 a month on YouTube, which is fantastic. And again, I appreciate all your guys' support in helping the channel grow. Uh, that's something that can definitely increase with time. And again, it's dynamic. Like some months I've made more than that, some months I've made less than that. It's not something that gradually grows. There's definitely like ebbs and flows with it. But uh, yeah, it's essentially paying the rent and a little bit of the Starbucks bill right now, which I'm super grateful for. And I'm hopeful that uh, I can kind of continue riding it and do it a little bit more as a full-time gig. So, you know, that number may seem high to some people, may seem low to other people, but really it's just kind of like if it's something you're thinking about doing, I definitely am supportive of uh, anybody kind of trying to start their own YouTube channel, whether or not it's to try to make money because aside from that, it's just such a cool worthwhile thing to be able to be part of a community and to share everything I've been sharing. So I'm just gonna keep cranking up the content and hopefully you guys keep watching. And also speaking of that, uh, I've partnered with another channel called Guitar Control and they're having me go live every Wednesday night at eight o'clock Eastern Standard Time. So if you wanna see, uh, if you haven't been able to get to some of the other live feeds I've been doing with Ian, uh, definitely tune in tonight, Wednesday at eight, because uh, I would love to see you guys there and every week I do something a little bit different. They give me a topic to go over. And this week's topic is the greatest guitar questions of all time, which I haven't even seen these questions yet. I would love it if you guys give me some questions because I don't have something to talk about because it's gonna be like 30, 45 minutes uh, total. And if I don't have any questions, I'm just gonna start making stuff up and then it could get kind of awkward real quick. So definitely I'm gonna put a link to their channel below. And if you guys wanna make it out, that would be awesome to talk to you then. Rock and roll comes from your balls, not your brains. Any attempt to rationalize music in a traditionally logical way is futile. You'd learn way more about Zeppelin while banging than you ever could with music theory. You know, I guess I'll count this as a Salty Blues comment, but uh, actually a Salty Blues comment that I almost kind of 100% agree with. Uh, you'll learn way more about Zeppelin while banging than learning music theory. In a way, I almost kind of agree with that. Question for your next one, is there a point when a guitar player should start to specialize or focus on one or two genres, or is it always good to be playing a little bit of everything? If so, how do I recognize when it's time to focus my practice time? Now, this is different for absolutely everybody. I think uh, for me, what's worked out a lot was to, once I kind of got proficient enough in one genre, I was all about just jumping around and playing as many different genres that I, as I could. And I think that 
kind of really helped me in finding what I recognize as like my own sound. I know if I never tried different genres, I know there's like a ton of different things that I never would have incorporated into my own playing. So I think that is a super valuable way to try to find your voice as a musician because if you just kind of practice one genre, you're going to be, you know, kind of stuck in there, which isn't a bad thing. You know, if like that's your goal and you just want to master one genre, if you just want to be the best metal player ever, just want to be like the best like jazz player, whatever, do your thing. Especially if you're kind of in a band and you really want to make the best of it, definitely do what you do and do it as well as you possibly can before you move ahead. But if you find you're kind of getting bored with practice, I think the number one thing to do is to maybe just pick up like an entirely new genre, even if it's something like you never think you'd be interested in. Like if you absolutely hate bluegrass music, try to learn like a bluegrass song and you'll, have, you'll, you'll develop an appreciation for the music and appreciation for the techniques. And uh, it'll definitely make you a better player overall. And you'd be surprised what you can take from other genres and to incorporate into your own playing, no matter how you kind of jump across genres. For your next Q&A, how do you listen to music besides with your ears? <laughs> Do you have one big playlist or do you go cover to cover of an album? Personally, I have six or seven big playlists where I dump stuff based on genre and then I go back to it once in a while, but I mostly listen to albums cover to cover, which I know it's a bit weird in the age of streaming, especially considering I've only ever owned like four physical discs in my life. So yeah, I kind of made the full switch over to streaming probably like a year ago. And I would say 60% of how I listen to music is through playlists. I have a long list of different genre playlists. My favorite one of which is probably that folk metal one where a lot of you guys gave me suggestions of different folk metal bands to listen to. So all the suggestions you guys gave me, I just loaded in that playlist and it's kind of like a never ending source of joy. I, so I'm, I'm a big playlist fan. Uh, another thing I do, I do still like to listen to full albums, but that's just more like when I get in the car and I just, something strikes me, I just kind of grab it. I'm on Apple Music. I haven't made the switch to Spotify yet, but I do like some of the suggested playlists that Apple Music has. And I'm also a big fan of St. Vincent, and she has kind of like a mixtape delivery service, which I think is pretty cool too. So definitely a playlist guy, but always too. I mean, there's so many good classic albums. I do still enjoy the, uh, just kind of the experience of listening to an album front to back Again, that's, I mostly only do that if I know I'm going to be in the car for like at least a half hour. But uh, if it's just going like from point A to point B, I generally hit the playlist. Since I know you're a Muse fan, what do you think of their new single? Also, if you're not familiar with the band Royal Blood, I strongly suggest you to check them out. So yeah, Royal Blood, definitely awesome band. If you haven't heard of them, I mean, come on, get with the program. Those guys are awesome. Check them out. Uh, new Muse, they've got that Dig Down, I think is what it's called. Again, kind of with the whole drones thing from last year, two years ago, I wasn't really that stoked about it when it first came out. Uh, drones, especially the entire album, has grown on me as time has gone by. I just listened to that whole album, actually, uh, not too long ago, in preparation for the Muse concert I went to two, three weeks ago, and they actually opened with Dig Down. And once they opened with it, it was like, okay, now I get it. I think it's one of those songs that when you hear it live, it makes almost more sense, like in context, and just hearing kind of like the album version as a single, and then again, just like as a show starter, absolutely awesome. So uh, Muse crushed it live, again, as always. Uh, even if there are Muse songs that you don't like when they play it live, somehow, even Undisclosed Desires is like listenable when it's live. So uh, I don't even know how to an accurately answer that question, if I like it or not, because live it's great. As a single, I'm not totally digging it, but uh, again, just as a true Muse fan, I'm always supportive of anything they put out. So I urge you to check it out and uh, support them because they're one of the great rock bands of all time and one of the few rock bands who are still out there putting in that work and doing it day in, day out. What is your opinion on Kings of Leon? If you've mentioned them before, then point me. So I don't think I have mentioned Kings of Leon yet because I have, I guess I have an interesting take on them. So uh, when they first came out, their first album, Youth and, Youth and Young Manhood, I think was such an awesome album. Probably one of the best like Southern rock albums I've like ever heard. Almost kind of like a modern day Leonard Skinner type take. Very cool guitar work, you know, really unique, interesting, good singer type band. Awesome album. And then if you followed uh, the band since then, they took a drastically drastically different turn ever since then. And it's one of those things that like, you know, I can be like a super hipster and like totally hate on them for selling out because it's not like the early stuff. 
But uh, I'm not going to do that because, I mean, they only really had the one album. So you kind of know what their inspirations were. And then they had an opportunity to kind of hit it big. They took it. They wrote some pop songs. They're more of like a pop rock band now. And uh, they've been massively successful. So I'm definitely not going to hate on them. But it's just something that I wasn't really interested in after their first album. So I am an absolutely huge fan of their first album. Ever since then, I haven't, they haven't really been on my radar, although I did see them open for U2, and I remember that well, because the sound guy absolutely sabotaged that band. Like, I, we've even talked about this on the channel before, where, like, the opening band kind of gets the shaft if they're opening for, like, a big headlining band, because the headliners sound so good, they make the openers sound, like, terrible, just to kind of, like, you know, make the headliners sound that much better. I have never seen... A, a worse example of this than what this poor sound guy did at the United Center in Chicago to Kings of Leon back then. It was really the worst sounding live band I've ever heard. And I know for a fact it was not their fault because they're like a solid band, you know? So definitely I like that first album. You guys should check that out. But uh, ever since then, you know, I've just kind of heard the stuff on the radio. I haven't really uh, kind of gotten too far into them. So for listening homework, we're going to go back to that excellent first Kings of Leon album, and I'm going to throw you to the last track on the album, Holy Roller Novocaine. Definitely a great throwback 70s Southern rock kind of song, and I hope you like it. Anyways, let me know what you think. And as always, if you have any questions or feedback, hit me up in the comments section on Instagram, Twitter, or the website, and I will talk to you all soon. Thanks a lot.